Coming up on today's Airborne, the Boeing 7879 Dreamliner earns its FAA and DIASA certification. Learjet 85 delays lead to workforce layoffs in Wichita and Mexico. And the NTSB releases its preliminary report on the Bedford, Massachusetts Gulfstream accident. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The Boeing 7879 Dreamliner comes closer to entering airline operation as it has gained certification by the FAA and EASA for commercial service. Boeing is now in the final stages of preparing for the first 7879 delivery to launch customer Air New Zealand. To earn certification for the 7879, Boeing undertook a comprehensive test program with five airplanes and more than 1,500 hours of flight testing, plus ground and laboratory testing, following the rigorous and thorough certification process. The FAA also has granted Boeing an amended production certificate validating that the Boeing production system can produce 7879s that conform to the design. EASA accepts FAA oversight of Boeing production certificates, just as the FAA accepts EASA oversight of European manufacturers' production certificates. 26 customers around the world have ordered 413 7879s, accounting for 40% of all 787 orders. It looks like Wichita has taken another hit. Bombardier has laid off or reassigned workers in Wichita and Mexico, as the Learjet 85 program continues to experience delays in its flight test program. The company said through a spokesperson that part of the problem was that the company had started from scratch to design the airplane. Isabel Gautier said that the clean sheet airplane uses innovative technologies and, quote, we had a learning curve and we've had some challenges. We're not where we expected to be in the program, end quote. While flight testing is continuing on the Learjet 85, Bombardier has been tight-lipped about the number of hours it has flown or when other flight test aircraft might begin flying. Also, an open question is when the airplane might enter service. Those who will be laid off should know by the end of June. You're watching Airborne. We'll be right back after these messages. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop an email to news spy at aero news.net. The NTSB has released its preliminary report on a runway excursion accident involving a Gulfstream G4 that occurred on May 31st, which resulted in the fatal injury of all seven people on board the aircraft. The preliminary report is detailed and focuses on readings from the cockpit's voice recorder and the flight data recorder. The CVR captured callouts of 80 knots, V1, and rotate. After the rotate callout, the CVR captured comments concerning aircraft control. FDR data indicated the airplane reached a maximum speed of 165 knots during the takeoff roll and did not lift off the runway. The FDR data further indicated thrust reversers were deployed and wheel brake pressures increased as the airplane decelerated. The NTSB is looking at the possibility that the flight control gust lock may have factored into the accident. The FDR data revealed the elevator control service position during the taxi and takeoff was consistent with its position if the gust lock was engaged. However, the gust lock handle was found in the off position and the elevator gust lock latch was found not engaged. There was also a mechanical interface to prevent the application of full power with the gust lock engaged. The investigation continues. 
With some 2,000 Aero TV programs webcast to cyberspace, sometimes it can be fun to look back and enjoy the places we've seen, the flyers we've met, and the planes we've flown. Here's a look at one of our favorite Aero TV classic episodes. This is high performance in going places and in soaring. You can compare it to a high-end automobile like a Porsche and uh, it goes, well, like hell, 140 knots at 10,000 feet on five gallons of gas and you can use MoGas. It cruises at 140 knots on five gallons of fuel per hour, yet it has the soaring capability of a competition glider. It's a whole other kind of high performance. Search STEMI S10VT on Aero TV's news channel. Sikorsky has turned on electrical power for the first time to the S97 Raider prototype helicopter, signaling successful installation of the avionics system and a major step towards completing the assembly of the new light tactical rotorcraft featuring X2 technology. The successful powering on means that the cockpit multifunctions displays and control display unit are operational, as are the CDU-controlled electronic circuit breakers. The S-97 Raider helicopter is a revolutionary rotorcraft that will outmatch conventional military helicopters in speed, maneuverability, and high-altitude operations. The fly-by-wire controlled helicopter will feature counter-rotating rigid main rotor blades for lift and forward flight, and a pusher propeller for high-speed acceleration and deceleration. Sikorsky proved the efficiency of the rigid rotor coaxial design in 2010, when its 6,000-pound gross-weight X-2 demonstrator helicopter achieved a 250-knot flight speed, or twice the speed of conventional helicopters. First flight is planned by the end of this year. Airborne is brought to you by some of the best sponsors in the aviation business. We'll be right back with more news. ADS-V will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States, but you can benefit from ADS-V today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADS-V out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Finally, the extraordinary story of the world-changing XPRIZE space competition is being told and illustrated with hundreds of insider photos in Jim Campbell's colorful new book, Beyond the Blue. Journey with Jim as he flies formation with spaceships, plays in zero gravity, prepares rocket racers, and documents the amazing first decade of the personal space race. Available this summer, get your advance order in now by checking out www.kindredspirit.com. A pilot for a skydiving company became one of the jumpers when the Cessna 182 he was flying was damaged by one of the skydivers exiting the airplane. Sean Ken Martin is a pilot for Fly Free Skydiving in Festus, Illinois. Recently, one of the skydivers exiting the airplane damaged the elevator of the Cessna when he jumped. Ken Martin stayed with the airplane as long as he could, but finally bailed out at about 2,000 feet when it became apparent that he could no longer maintain control. It's a common policy for skydive pilots to wear a parachute just in case something like this happens. The skydiver who struck the elevator on the way out of the airplane was reportedly uninjured. Sierra Nevada Corporation says its Dream Chaser prototype will resume flight testing before the end of 2014. Tom Patton reports. The company conducted unmanned drop tests with the aircraft last year, but those stopped after the left landing gear malfunctioned during the first free flight test and the prototype skittered off the runway after touchdown. Now SNC Vice President for Space Systems Mark Serengello says the company is ready to begin testing again with several automated drop tests followed by flights with a pilot on board, according to a report from Fox News. Serengello made the announcement during a news conference which took place at Cape Canaveral in which SNC announced a partnership with Craig Technologies. That company recently renovated a hangar formerly dedicated to the Space Shuttle and will provide multiple contracted products and services to the Dream Chaser program. 
For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Get comprehensive real-time 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. Please remember Airborne is streamed three times a week and is always online. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.